In this video, you'll get to grips with the future of artificial intelligence through the prism of chess. Now and again it tends to be hard to assess the situation. Take a look at the world and see how it's changing progressively. The most recent 50 years have been set apart by a data upheaval that has gotten so immersed in our day-by-day -day experience that it's not difficult to fail to remember exactly how groundbreaking it is. Gary Kasparov makes an amazing contention for reflecting upon our evolving times. He drives us through the sorts of inquiries we ought to posture of innovation and what we may expect of this quickly advancing world. It's work he's very capable to do. As one of history's most prominent chess players, he was set in opposition to a group of PC researchers and their forefront innovation. Could their machines beat him? Kasparov's fighting with IBM's Deep Blue in the last part of the 1990s settled that question. Additionally, the mechanics of chess and of man-made brainpower share a ton for all intents and purposes. So when you consider the big picture, you can gain proficiency with a great deal about the functions of the advanced mechanical world through the social story of chess. Allow Kasparov to take you on an excursion through the set of experiences and the fate of computerized reasoning, chess, and PCs. In these chapters, you'll learn why PC professionals aren't reliable, which lunchbox item caused a fracas at the 1978 World Chess Championship, the basic programming standards behind Google Assistant and Amazon's Alexa, Apply intelligence from a scope of various controls to help you settle on a better contributing choice. Chess is an antiquated game, and it's had a spot in Western culture for quite a long time. Be that as it may, while it's appreciated by the vast majority, it's frequently from a protected distance. That is likely down to the way that chess has a specific standing it can't shake. Normally, chess obsessives are considered as having no life outside the 64 squares of the chessboard. The creator? Gary Kasparov has made a special effort to challenge such biases. Notwithstanding, despite the relative multitude of meetings he has given where he talks about governmental issues and history, the media have kept on portraying him and other chess players as offbeat weirdos. However, they are simply common people with exceptional ability. It's difficult to move since quite a while ago held social convictions. Chess players actually wait at the lower part of any school social order. In any case, there are indications of progressive improvement in the U.S. because of the presentation of school chess programs. Little youngsters are finding, without bias, that chess can really be entertaining. The American perspective on chess remains an extraordinary differentiation to the circumstance in Russia. There, chess has for quite some time been adored. At the point when Kasparov was growing up, Russia was still essential for the Soviet Union. Chess was generally played and widely advanced. Subsequently, it never had the unflattering affiliations it had in the West. Or maybe, it had a lot of a similar status as some other well-known game, similar to baseball in the US. Truth be told, the custom of holding chess players and educators in high respect returns to Tsarist occasions. Even though numerous blue bloods were murdered during the Russian Revolution, the distinguished custom of playing chess didn't vanish. All things considered, the communists developed and energized it. They even ventured to such an extreme as to absolve world-class chess players from military help in the progressing Russian common war so they could partake in Soviet chess titles. Computers went from just about beating chess novices to testing grandmasters. As computational science made its first provisional strides during the 1950s, barely any individual speculated where this innovation would lead. Forecasts of idealistic and tragic prospects constrained by PCs were normal. Yet, it was every one of the somewhat fantastical when you consider that the primary PCs verged on having the option to play chess. Researchers attempted, however, in 1956. A research center in Los Alamos, New Mexico built up the principal chess-playing PC. The machine was called Maniac One, and it was one of the absolute first PCs that had enough memory to store a chess program. It weighed around 1,000 pounds. All things considered, the PC's ability was as yet restricted. The researchers needed to utilize a decreased leading body of 36 squares, which included getting rid of the ministers. The PC wound up losing to an accomplished player, even though they had made him play without a sovereign, notwithstanding. That very year, the PC figured out how to beat a chess beginner. It was the first run-through in history that computerized reasoning had vanquished a human in a scholarly game, sooner rather than later. PCs were adequately incredible to challenge grandmasters. The speed of progress is generally clarified by Moore's law, which expresses that PCs handling speeds constantly twofold like clockwork. By 1977, PCs could contend with the top 5% of human players. They would in general make infrequent game-losing mistakes, yet thereby large solid cautious and strategic moves frequently countered this disappointment. Furthermore, 
Another calculation, refined by PC researchers during the 1970s, had a very large effect. It was called alpha-beta and it permitted the PCs to naturally dismiss any move that was less viable than the one being considered at that point, narrowing the number of moves it needed to assess. Therefore, PCs turned out to be quicker at figuring potential moves and even had the ability to think a few pushes forward. Computers are putting humans out of work. But it's nothing to get irritated up about. It's not difficult to envision that the calling of the store clerk will before long be a relic of times gone by. All things considered, self-checkout machines are solidly building up their place in general stores. This model is characteristic of a more extensive pattern. PCs are making people unemployed, particularly those with occupations in the assistance business. Discussions that set people in opposition to machines returned to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution when rural and producing gear began to supplant human workers. At that point, during the 1960s and 1970s, correctly designed machines viably made talented workers, for example, watchmakers or research center partners, out of date. At long last, the information revolution came riding in on the rear of the approach of the web. At a stroke, a great many help and backing occupations were cleared out, workers, for example, bank employees and travel planners ended up generally supplanted by online e-administrations. It is without a doubt a short time before machines begin to invalidate even the most renowned callings. Truly, even specialists and legal counselors. All that said, there's no compelling reason to get wistful over the way that machines would now be able to bear human work. Innovative advancement has generally been something to be thankful for. Human progress has created in huge part since we've utilized our developments to diminish the requirement for human work. Subsequently, we've seen increments in personal satisfaction and the progression of common freedoms. It is genuinely an indication of our advantage that we can live in cooled rooms, flick through gadgets that give us admittance to the entirety of humanity's information, and still grumble that difficult work is being. This simply implies we need to figure out how to adjust. Things aren't returning to the manner in which they used to be. Assistance Clerks and call focus representatives whose work has been supplanted by computerized reasoning won't ray visitation of blue-collar positions, for instance. All things considered, they should be coordinated towards new sorts of innovative and administration occupations as they arise. Artificial intelligence is developing rapidly, prompting new kinds of chess-playing machines. In September 2016, Kasparov visited an advanced mechanics occasion in Oxford where he had the option to talk straightforwardly with a robot called Artie. Such talking robots may in any case appear to be really advanced, however. They make certain to turn into a fundamental part of everyday life very soon as improvements in man-made reasoning proceed. It's for quite some time been held that PCs can think of arrangements. Yet not at all like people, they can't plan questions. In any case, that is not true anymore. PCs would already be able to pose inquiries. Yet they can't, so far, realize which questions are the significant ones. Any gadget can ask you an inquiry that has been coded into it. It simply needs a brief and a computerized reaction that goes with it for this situation as an inquiry. That is how gadgets like Google Assistant or Amazon's Alexa work. Be that as it may, regardless of whether the connection appears to be bona fide, it's in reality dependent on essential information investigation. Researchers are presently attempting to see whether machines can form their own inquiries straightforwardly from the information they've reaped. They'll presently don't require a bunch of human prompts for setting off robotized reaction questions. Machines may one day even develop past that. As man-made consciousness creates, they may shock us with the information they produce as well as with their strategies. How about we take a gander at how that may function in chess? Up to this point, chess PCs had chess methodologies straightforwardly customized into them. They realized that a sovereign was worth more than a rook. For instance, since this information was coded into the program, however, Presently, analysts are attempting to create chess PCs simply by programming them with the most essential chess rules. From that point forward, they're intended to work out all the other things without anyone else, which means they can think of totally novel procedures and plays that they could likewise instruct people. For people, chess is mental, for PCs, it's simply vital. It's a continuous discussion with regards to if chess ought to be viewed as a game. What is sure? Notwithstanding, is that the apprehensive weariness experienced after a chess move is on a standard with fatigue felt toward the finish of a track race. This is because chess is eventually a mental game. Since 2003, Kasparov has been considering chess matches played by acclaimed grandmasters, including his own. He spread out his revelations in his book My Great Predecessors and contended that even the best chess players commit numerous strategic errors. Obviously, it's not because they don't have the foggiest idea about any better. 
It's because of the reality they're on edge or mentally worn out by their adversaries. The German chess player Emanuel Lasker, who was world chess champion for a very long time somewhere in the range of 1894 and 1921, typified the mental way to deal with chess. The thought was that the best move need not really bode well strategically, yet that it should make an adversary as awkward as could be expected. This style of play requires cautious examination of a rival's down before a match starts. Shortcomings should be recognized, just as the moves will on the way to mentally destabilize that person. No such principles apply when PCs play chess. A human will consistently have a mental response to the pressure of a match. However, PCs are aloof, both through chess games. For them, it's simply an issue of technique. By 1985, PCs were at that point sufficiently incredible to figure each conceivable mix of moves throughout the following three or four turns and pick the most proper one. Yet, if the player had the option to plan at any rate five pushes forward, it was very workable for him to overcome a PC. Taking care of PCs a lot of information can bring about splendid projects. Yet they can likewise be inclined to blunders. It's a familiar way of thinking that achievement settles upon intrinsic ability. In any case, as Malcolm Gladwell wrote in Outliers, this is begging to be proven wrong. What is important is a long time of training. For people, Gladwell's postulation holds some reality. In any case, all things considered, there's no vulnerability. Savage power is what matters. Donald Mitchie, a British specialist in the field of man-made brain power and AI pioneer, was among the first to truly exploit this when he started blending PCs with a lot of crude information. He tried the idea in the round of tic-tac-toe in 1960. Ordinarily, you may give a PC a progression of rules to apply in a game. Yet, Michi gave the PC various instances of game moves and permitted it to work out fundamental standards from that point. We really see such an AI cycle constantly with current interpretation projects. For example, Google Translate. They don't really know much about the dialects. All things considered, they've recently been taking care of millions of model sentences with relating interpretations made by individuals. In light of these, they're ready to bite together with a sensible interpretation of some random content. Such frameworks are not trustworthy. Be that as it may, PCs that depend on gigantic measures of information can likewise make monstrous blunders. During the 1980s, Michi attempted to make a chess-playing machine. He and some different scientists stuffed the PC with crude information. A huge number of chess moves played during Grandmaster games. The PC turned into an incredible player yet one that would sometimes do puzzling things, as abruptly penance its sovereign for no evident explanation. What had happened was that the PC had gained from the Grandmasters that forfeiting the sovereign could be a move that flagged triumph. Obviously, the PC had neglected to perceive that the ploy possibly worked when numerous different boundaries were set up. Maybe it got everything. Except for the imaginative chess moves. Losing is rarely simple yet playing against PCs can show you how to lose smoothly, for some individuals. A game is only a game and that's it. Be that as it may, some burst into tears or see red on the off chance that they lose. The creator, in his chess playing days, was not really a blubberer, yet he wasn't actually a glad failure by the same token. At the point when he lost a chess move, he at times languished restless evenings over days after. In some cases, he'd even pitch fits at grant services in the event that he didn't bring home the victor's prize. Also, Kasparov isn't embarrassed about this conduct. All things considered, to be a decent contender. Your abhorrence of losing must be more noteworthy than your dread of contending, else you'll just stop. Fortunately, the creator didn't have to confront misfortunes regularly. Of the 24-0 professional matches he played, he just lost a few. Be that as it may, those games were against people. Playing PCs was another story altogether. Kasparov lost a game to a PC without precedent for May 1994. In Munich, its name was Fritz III. Kasparov played well from the outset and accomplished a worthwhile position. However, at that point, he took only one deliberately shaky action, promptly. The PC was back in the game. The misstep was reasonable. It was a rush chess competition, an organization where players regularly require only seconds to consider each move. Despite the fact that Kasparov, at last, won the entire competition, it was the first occasion when a PC had figured out how to vanquish a chess title holder, Kasparov proceeded to confront a much more impressive PC, IBM's Deep Blue, under competition conditions a couple of years after the fact in 1996. This time it was a full match with more than six games. Kasparov dominated the main game. Yet at the rematch the next year, Deep Blue was the victor. It was a nearby match. 
Yet eventually, Deep Blue could figure such countless potential choices for each move that Kasparov couldn't keep up. It denoted a significant triumph for man-made brainpower. It was a snapshot of acknowledgement for Kasparov. He could now be consistently beaten by PCs. And they made certain to get just more remarkable later on. What's more? With that, Kasparov surrendered to the experience of losing. Chess is no more odd to injustice. And PCs won't change that, as onlookers. We for the most part see the charming sides of serious games, yet, in the background. In the shadows, unfairness is not really bizarre. In a good way. These tales can show up very interesting. Take the unpleasant competition of Anatoly Karpov and Viktor Korknoi. The two prevailing parts during the 1970s. At the 1978 World Championships in the Philippines, Karpov employed an analyst called Dr. Zhukar to gaze eagerly at Korknoi all through the match, trying to spellbind or occupy him. Korknoi would not be outshone. During a similar title, he enrolled some Indian organization individuals to think and gaze at Karpov and his clinician, trying to scare them. Furthermore, every one of them continually blamed the other for cheating and would request to have different articles the other had examined. These incorporated Korknoi's seat and glasses and, broadly, Karpov's yogurt. Nowadays, PCs haven't disposed of the presence of unfairness, it simply exists in an alternate structure. For example, a specific measure of human mediation on PCs is permitted during matches. Specialists figure out bugs, restart PCs on the off chance that they crash, and change PCs' evaluative capacities between games. At the hour of Kasparov, popular rematch with Deep Blue in 1997, these standard adjustments were at that point acknowledged. Indeed, Deep Blue slammed twice during the six games and was restarted on the two events. Since the restarts eradicated the PC's memory tables, it would have driven it to take various actions and choices than it would have had it not smashed. The legal setting off of this sort of occasion during matches could be a path for specialists to give PCs an unjustifiably favorable position. As an outcome, specialists' intercessions are presently more immovably managed. Chess is a perplexing and wonderful game, however, it, at last, demonstrated basic enough for PCs to dominate. That much was proof when Deep Blue beat the creator, utilizing only the preparing power accessible in the last part of the 1990s. The following test for software engineering will be to get PCs to dominate more intricate table games with a greater number of squares and factors than chess. Something like the Chinese game Go will do just perfect. Final summary. The main message in these chapters. Man-made brain power, is a quick unbelievable human insight. It has had the ability to beat top-notch chess players at the game for more than 20 years, however. Considerably more is normal. For now, PCs are primarily utilizing beast figuring power and their capacities to handle tremendous measures of information to do this. In any case, another insurgency in man-made brain power is in the offing. If PCs can begin to examine the information, Define inquiries from it, and create arrangements freely of human info, at that point we will have really entered another time. You like what you hear? Check out other personal development or business books. This video was made possible by your support. It takes a very long time to make one of our videos. So thanks to your contributions to Patreon and watching our videos, we are slowly able to do more and more of them. If you want to help us out, check out the Patreon page. If you like the contents of this video, Check out other books in the description and suggest what book we should cover next.